Hey everybody, I'm Brian Clapp, VP of Content and Engaged Learning for WorkInSports.com, and this is the Work in Sports Podcast. I've been spending a lot of time lately considering the plights of different types of people during this global pandemic. Obviously, this is tragic. People are losing their jobs and many are losing their lives. I thank from the bottom of my heart all of those people on the front lines of this pandemic, from the healthcare workers to the grocery clerks who risk their own health to help others admirable traits, and I wish you nothing but health. But I've also been thinking about those of us locked down and isolated in our homes. You know, I live in an area with some land. We have about four acres. I have my kids home with me, my wife. I'm surrounded by my people. We have computers, TV, internet, food, phones, a ping pong table, stable jobs for now, a huge garden. Like we have nothing to complain about. Others aren't so lucky. This for them is far more challenging. They live in small apartments. They don't have access to the internet. They are all alone. This for them can be torture. Empathy, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and understanding their plight is really important right now. I got my first job in Atlanta at 21 years old, had never been there before, didn't know anyone and had a crappy apartment, like really crappy. I couldn't imagine being locked in place at that time. I would have gone nuts. Even later in my 20s, I moved in with my future wife, just the two of us in another crappy apartment, this time in Seattle, Fremont to be specific. Great neighborhood. All these super cool things just outside our door within walking distance, but I keep imagining what it would have been like if we would have been trapped inside. I mean, I'm not sure we would be still married now if that happened. So I look at my situation now and say, not so bad. But I can also realize that so many of you are in a situation that makes this hard and uncomfortable and your motivating thoughts of, I'm going to learn new things and catch up on good books, may have drifted off by week six of this situation. I've also been thinking about personality differences and how they can influence someone, how someone is handling the situation. An extrovert is likely really having a hard time right now. Try and have game night on Zoom or FaceTime with friends the quiet moments are likely crushing their spirit. Introverts, on the other hand, largely get their energy from inside themselves and selected interactions with people. So they're likely handling this with a little bit more grace. I don't know that for sure, but it seems like it might be true. Some people may not have even realized who they were until these moments. True, there's a lot of self-discovery that's happening right now. You might not have realized just how much of an extrovert you were until the ability to be socially engaged was taken away. If you're feeling right now this deep desire to be around other people, maybe you're more extroverted than you than you thought, and this is this is hell for you. But if you are okay with this scenario and surprised at how well you are handling this unexpected change, well, maybe you're more introverted than you realized prior. Maybe you are better at generating uh, energy from inside, which is a powerful thing to know. This is good. This can be a positive for everyone, because the more you understand yourself and how you tick, the more you can set yourself up for success. Today's guest is a self-identified extrovert. She loves large, passionate, screaming groups of sports fans, and that love serves her well in her role as director of marketing for Lenore Ryan Athletics. Just a few years removed from her undergrad, Leah Clayton has carved out quite a path for herself, and she's here to tell us all about it while getting some of that extrovert energy out. Here's Leah Clayton. Hi, Leah. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Brian. How are you? I'm great. Uh, You're coming to us from North Carolina. I'm up here in Pennsylvania. Neither one of us have gotten out of our houses in a long time, so let's talk a little bit about our careers. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Way better than all the Netflix I've been binging. Oh, yeah. Well, wait, well let's start with there then. What have you been binging? <laughs> um, Tiger it's been King. a mix of things. I've had, uh, you know, Friends isn't on Netflix anymore, so I had to find something else to just keep playing. <laughs> okay. um, so I had to find something new and ended up switching over to 30 Rock. I've never watched that before, but it's pretty good. Okay, so you're a, you're a sitcom kind of person? You like the uh, the, the comedic shows? Yeah, I like this kind of for some background noise because, you know, being an extrovert, I hate, I absolutely hate this. I hate to be in my house, um, not seeing my friends, not seeing people at work. So I got to have some noise going on, whether that's the TV or music playing. So something is always on on my TV and it's usually a sitcom um, unless I'm like actually sitting down to watch something, in which case it's like a 
um, this is us or, you know, something else kind of stereotypical there, but hey, they're all good. <laughs> I like that you even identified yourself as stereotypical. That's great. <laughs> yeah, we, we just finished up uh, binging Ozark, which was awesome. And I don't know, it's a little darker than 30 Rock or Friends, so I don't know if it's up your alley, but it's... I've it's... heard great things about it. I'm going to have to add it to my list because I think I'm going to run out of shows to watch, so yeah. I bet I'll get there soon. It's so good. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> we'll get back on track here. Before yeah. before we get into sports, sports marketing in athletics and your life, and your role at Lenore Ryan. Let's go back to your beginning a little bit. Why college sports and why marketing? How did you kind of find this fit for yourself? Okay, so really what I found is that I absolutely love game day atmosphere. You know, I love a, a big, roaring crowd, um, an intense fourth quarter moment. You know, when people are on the edge of their seats and we finally get that, you know, touchdown or that three-pointer or the free throw that everybody's just dead silent for. And you get that and all of a sudden everybody comes up and roars and it, it's exciting. I live for those kinds of moments. So um, when I, I got to App State and experienced my first ever college football game, um, I got there and saw all of it and realized, like, I had to figure out a way to do this and be involved in this. Um, and eventually, you know, my uh, path led me to end up in a marketing internship role. And, you know, fast forward a few years, and here I am at Lenore Ryan is marketing. And I absolutely love it because I get to see that game day atmosphere thing all the time. See, I love that. It's like the, all of us have these moments that stick out for us of, like, this was the moment that I knew. And and, I, yeah. and and that feeling of being at a big event and just that kind of everything that goes into it, I can totally understand why that captivated you. Oh, yeah. It, it's fantastic to be in a, a crowd of 30,000 or 60,000 or, you know, we traveled to some games like we went to Georgia and yeah, I forget how big Georgia Stadium is, but big. it's giant. <laughs> There's big. tons of people there. And to be in that and have... And even like two different sides competing against each other and all those different fans cheer in different ways. But to be in the middle of all of that and experience it and everybody's watching this football game, that's incredible. And I love that. So, you know, those moments are the ones that made me realize I want to be involved with sports and be able to help create those moments even more and for other people. Okay, so you had a pretty unique perspective on it all, too, because when you were at Appalachian State, you you, you got your undergrad oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. degree. Hold on, how did you pronounce Appalachian State? Oh, did I say Appalachian? <laughs> You're right. Uh, you, know what's, you know what's terrible, too, is I lived in Atlanta for seven years, so I should really yeah. know how these things are said. I, we'll have to practice that together. And I love that you just called me out. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, okay, so we can go back now. Yeah, exactly. Let's get back. We'll get going again. Uh, so you got your degree in communication and PR, but you had a unique perspective on these sports events because you were a four year member of the cheerleading squad as well. What's the biggest misconception that you faced about being a cheerleader? Let's just be honest here. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I, I love these questions. Um, you know, a lot of people think, and I'm not like everybody here, but I don't think cheerleading is a sport. <laughs> um, I do think we're incredibly athletic. I mean, I learned how to lift and Olympic lift with our strength and conditioning coaches at App um, and can run sprints and did all the things like that, whatever, the 6 a.m. lifts really sucked. But you know, <laughs> it's not a sport <laughs> um, because really the whole purpose of having a cheerleading team in general is to, you know, build the the fan interaction and get everybody to cheer defense um, when we need it and those kinds of things. So really, you know, that's the purpose of cheerleading. And so I don't think it's a sport. It does have the competitive elements and, you know, lots of different ways you can go with it. But to its root and to its core, cheerleading isn't a sport. So that's probably the biggest misconception that people probably think I am like all gung-ho. And people love to bring that up and ask me that question. I always kind of shock them when I say that. Yes, yeah, so they they start out thinking that they're going to debate you on it, and you're like, yeah, I agree with you. I'm like, really? If you want me to, I can stay here for 30 minutes and tell you why it's not important. And then they're like, okay, never mind. <laughs> you just totally had them off of the pass. But okay, but <laughs> but give yourself a little bit of credit. But like, be, you're still a student athlete, right? Because you even said there's a lot oh, yeah. of athletic challenges to it. Uh, so oh, yeah. as a student athlete, you do face unique challenges. I mean, you have different requirements for your time, your training, mm -hmm. your discipline, mm -hmm. your accountability, all that, your coachability, working with a team, all that. What do you, would you say you learned most personally during your time on the cheerleading squad and as a student athlete? I mean, time management was probably the biggest thing that I had to learn. I mean, even from day one of stepping on campus and going to cheerleading practice, and it was the first time... Sorry, my dog and cat just ran across the room. It's okay. They're, they're allowed to do that. 
it was the first time um, that I was entirely responsible for myself and getting myself to somewhere on time. I didn't have, you know, mom to come in and make sure that I was up to go to school or anything. And um, it was the first time I had said, um, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. Um, so that was like, the, I mean, that's one of those moments that just kind of sticks out from it. But having to manage practices and lifts and homework and games and appearances and everything else on top of that, that was probably the biggest thing that I learned. What's your dog's name? Oh, his name is Brewer after um, Kid Brewer Stadium app. <laughs> Wait, what? what is it named after? I didn't hear that. Uh, Brewer after Kid Brewer Stadium, which is app football stadium. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Well, what are, what's the cat then? Is the cat the kid? Oh, God, you're going to love this. Um, the cat's name is Joe. Um, <laughs> Wait, 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 I said that's um, after LR's mascot, which is Joe Bear. Oh my gosh, you're you're definitely addicted to your teams. I like that. You're loyal. <laughs> Do you have like I a am, gerbil? Do you have like a gerbil you named after your high school mascot? No, I didn't have a gerbil, no. Oh, all right, <laughs> guinea pig, whatever. Okay, so during this time at, on the cheerleading squad, you also were the social media coordinator and handled the media relations for the squad. So how, how important did you identify it as a time to make the most out of every experience and try to get some professional experience out of this time as well? Uh, so I knew that, you know, trying to make a, we, we didn't exist on social media. And like also that was back in 2013, 14. Um, so obviously that stuff was still around then, but it wasn't quite as big as it, and important as it is now. So I wanted to be able to get us online, get us a presence. Um, and I knew that that would be helpful with recruiting other cheerleaders after I was gone. Um, and I knew that it would also be a good resume builder for me. Um, and not only help the team, but also help me gain that experience. And I learned so much through that because I also did a lot of things that, like, I look back at some of the graphics that I made for it. It was horrible. <laughs> but it was a good learning opportunity. And to also to see now where it's at and how it's evolved and other people have taken it over, it looks great. So I'm proud of it. Yeah, you have to start from somewhere. And that's how you learn is by trying and failing a little bit, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I've had to learn that. Like, you just got to go for things sometimes. And, you know, sometimes your promotion isn't good. Um, sometimes <laughs> no student takes part in uh, the 1990s throwback night that you throw, and, and that's okay. <laughs> but you learn from it, and you do better next time, and it, and it get better. See, that stinks because I'm actually a product of the 1990s, so I you just you just made me feel really old, and that's a throwback night. But I guess that's just <laughs> it's just the reality of things, right? Um, so, I yeah, know, I know. I still have all my old flannel shirts. Anyway, um, after graduating from App State, and I'm not going to even bother trying to say Appalachian. Did I say it right that time? There you go. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you ended up at Lenora Ryan, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, too. But you were... No, you got that one right. Oh, you're, thank you're goodness. Good. All right, good. Uh, you ended up as a graduate assistant for marketing promotions as you were pursuing mm -hmm. your MBA. So I have a lot of people asking me all the time about being a graduate assistant, but I never did it. I, n I was never in that role. I started at CNN Sports Illustrated right after I graduated college. So tell me, what was that experience like, and how did you kind of find that balance between being a student and a worker? Um, I love this question because it's the exact opposite of what we tell every single student athlete, what I tell every single student athlete, I did not put school first. Um, and that's because <laughs> I knew, I, I know it's crazy, but it's because I knew that if I gave 110% and did everything I could to be the best I could at my job as a graduate assistant, that would serve me much better in the long run than making sure I got an A plus on every single paper that I turned in. Um, and I also, I approached my graduate assistant position, not as I was there as a GA, like everybody else and not to like put myself above them, but, um, I, I took it as I was there for a full-time job. You know, I dressed like it when some of the other GAs across the department and from other places maybe didn't always dress like it and, and that's okay, but that's how I chose to do it. Um, and then I, I was always there from, you know, the standard nine to five plus whatever I needed to be. I didn't do just the minimum 20 or the maximum 20 hours that they say you're supposed to do as a GA. Honestly, none, none of us in athletics did. But still, I, I took that mindset to say, this is my full-time job because it was at the time, even though I wasn't getting paid like it. And eventually that led to where I was. So for me, putting um, work first was 
hugely beneficial. See, I, I seriously want to give you a standing ovation right now because that's real. <laughs> like that's like transparent and real because people seem to forget, like you're not getting hired because you had a 3.7 GPA or whatever. You're not getting hired for that reason. You're getting hired because of what you've been able to do. And if you took your role seriously as a GA and put that work into it and showed up professionally, well, that's what's going to stand out more than anything else. Right. And it's also, you have that real world experience and you're going to be able to hold yourself well in a meeting because you've done that and you were able to go to those meetings that you didn't have to be at, but you were invited to, even though you'd like worked the doubleheader the night before and done X, Y, and Z, and you were tired and probably had a homework assignment that you could still be working on. If you go to that meeting and like take the opportunity to learn and also show up and show face, a lot of them just showing face is so beneficial. Yeah. Um, that's going to help you out so much more than making sure you got every single comma right in that paper you're turning in. Well, okay, that's that's exactly, I think that's a, a vitally important statement you're making right there. But also, this led to your first job. Like, that is the absolute thing people are saying all the time. It's like, how do I get that first job? How do I get that first job? And isn't, mm-hmm. it, isn't it that attitude of taking that internship, like, like frame your GA as like an internship type experience, but taking yeah, that yeah. super, super seriously, like it was a job and impressing the right people? I mean, isn't that exactly what it boils down to? Yes, absolutely. I mean, kind of still in my thunder there for like my big advice that I would give to um, somebody <laughs> looking to get in there. But one of my big pieces is to always say yes. Like, yes, I'll do the extra work. Yes, I will work the extra game or stay late or do whatever I need to because that's what would be expected of you um, in, a, in a full-time position as well. So making sure that you say yes and show up and take it seriously is going to make the biggest difference. It's so true. So, okay, I have to be completely transparent here. Prior to this year, and I've been in the sports industry for 20 years, and I've covered all kinds of college sports. Prior to this year, I had never heard of Lenore Ryan. (laughs) And then literally in the last year, I've met three different people connected to Lenore Ryan. Yourself, uh, Kyle Duggar, who's a top prospect uh, this year. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. (laughs) And then Lauren Romano, who's a big, a big member of our, uh, our community with our podcast and is a big part of our, um, our private Facebook group. Another person, I'm, she, she was the first one that told me about Lenore Ryan. I'm like, I've never even heard of this place, but now it's all over the place. So uh-huh. this, that's a long way of me asking you to tell us a little bit more about Lenore Ryan and what, in your view, makes it a special community to be, community to be a part of. Well, first, the fact that you are just now learning about LR means that I, me and a bunch of other people are starting or doing our jobs well. So yes. that's a good thing. But, you know, what makes LR so special is really um, the city that we're in. We're in the city of Hickory, which is when I say city, it's not like you're a big metropolitan area like Charlotte is in, in North Carolina. Um, but it, it's a big giant town with a suburban town with 30, 40, 50,000 people. Okay. But really, it's, it's the community support here that makes LR so so special because I mean not even all these people went to LR a lot of them went to App State or went to UNC Charlotte Chapel Hill NC State etc um but they, but they love LR I mean we are their hometown team if they're not going up to Boone or over to Raleigh to go watch their team play on a Saturday they're coming over to watch us play and that is huge to have that kind of support especially at, at being at the D2 level kind of like knowing where we stand on the totem pole um, to have that is so huge. I mean, we even had um, our city of Hickory mayor. He did a proclamation um, during our football playoff run and made the Friday before ends up being our last um, playoff game, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, making that Friday red and black day, asking all of the city of Hickory to wear red and black in support of the Bears. I mean, you don't get that everywhere. Yeah. So is it totally different than App State then? Uh, very much so. And I would say that's mostly because... Like, at Boone, North Carolina is a college town. You know, you, you walk down Teen Street, which is, like, your main street area, whatever, um, and you've got, like, T-shirt shops, and they, there's, like, thousand different app shirts, stickers, everything you can want that has app and Yosef and black and gold on it. Um, and it, it's truly a college town. But Hickory is not. I mean, it's a suburban town. There are families here and people who have lived here from the day that they were born to they're retiring here now. So, I mean, it's not a college town, it's a suburban town, but they love LR. So it is very different. So to be able to get that support and harness that and use it to our benefit is what makes this so special. So I read in the press release when you're when you were promoted to uh, director of marketing, 
that you plan, and this was the quote for, from your AD, I think, but that you will plan over a hundred athletic events during the course of the academic year. That to me sounds very broad. So let's get specific. At a small school like LR, what does it mean for you to be the director of marketing for the athletic department? What does that actually boil down to? Well, uh, I wear a lot of different hats, um, like anybody at Division Two would. Um, so, you know, focusing in on that marketing role, I, I oversee the marketing of all of our teams, um, from football, basketball, swimming, track and field, cross country, you know, all, everybody, I'm not going to name all of them. Um, but, you know, promoting those games, getting people to the games, making sure that the music that plays at their games is clean, um, and also the, the right music and that we have a good, exciting game day atmosphere for all of our sports. I mean, that's probably my biggest focus. Um, but I mean, I'm one woman who can't be at every single game and do everything. So I actually rely a lot on our team of interns who are super, super helpful, love them to death. Um, and I, I oversee them and I help develop them to make sure that they can, they can be my lead intern for soccer and write a whole marketing plan and, um, figure out how to get people, like have them actually lead the marketing for that. And, um, Delete it, yeah. <laughs> um, but then, you know, I also, with that marketing comes along ticketing, um, the community service piece. I'm the athletic liaison for several different um, departments across campus. Um, I do a bunch of event planning. Um, it, it encompasses a lot. But, I mean, my favorite piece of it is definitely the marketing, the game day piece, and the community relations piece. So you're not too far removed yourself from being in an internship type GA role, and now you're leading those groups. What have you learned about being a leader amongst people who are looking for guidance? Oh man, that's a, that's a tough one. You didn't yeah. put that on the list. Yeah, I know. I have to sneak some in there sometimes. I can't prepare you for everything. I know, I know. Um, really what I've learned about being a leader is that you need to know who you're leading. Um, and are you leading them to make them better or to make yourself better and make yourself look good? Ooh, I like and that. so, and I've taken, I've grown a lot in this position and seen like where I started at, where I was even before I had this position to where I am now and to be able to be here and actually help some of the interns that I've had for two years now go off and get another GA position on their own. And I had this one moment, um, where I was, I was kind of nervous about this one guy and he was applying for GA positions. And I was like, well, did I prepare him enough? Did I, did I teach him enough? I wanted to make sure he didn't go out there and then not know what to do. And he let text me back. He was like, no, you've done everything that you should. I'm as prepared as I possibly can be. Thank you. And that made a huge difference to me. Yeah. I thought, wow, like, I, I, I'm doing this. And it made me feel really good. But you know that I like am genuinely helping him, helping him find a job and help, leading him to be in this industry as well. That was huge. So knowing that you're in it to help those people that you're leading, I think that is so important. I completely agree. And frankly, that's been one of the biggest uh, moments for me in my career was getting to a point where I was, you know, helping people find their own success and helping guide yeah. them on that path. And that is so rewarding. So that's really cool. Uh, so yeah. obviously things have been turned upside down by coronavirus. We cannot just ignore that this is going on in our world right now. I'm glad that we're having an upbeat and powerful conversation right now. It's awesome. But we got to, you know, be honest about what's happening around us as well. What are you doing now to keep yourself sharp and plan for the future that we will eventually hopefully have? <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Um. Yeah, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Um, I am, you know, trying to stay up to date with what other people are doing. I mean, our team meets every single Monday to get a game plan or to talk about what we're doing this week, what we're doing next week, making sure that we're, we're all on the same page. And r right now we're, we're planning as if everything's going back to normal here soon, um, you know, in the next month or two or so, and football's going to go as normal. So hopefully it stays that way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, staying up to date with what other people are doing and keep it, you know, so one thing about being a division two and limited resources, smaller staff, um, a lot of times people can think that like we can't do big things. Or they, like um, people who have been in similar roles to mine say, well, we can't do that. We just don't have the resources. Um, but I, I don't like to think that way. Like I may see something really great or something huge that another big FBS school did, but I want to bring it back and do it to us. Um, so finding those ideas right now and figuring out how to scale them back and make them to where they're hours that we can do them and still be awesome and big. I'm doing a lot of that right now um, and planning for the fall and doing all of that. Um, and we're also, you know, talking with a bunch of other industry professionals. We, um, we started a Zoom call a couple weeks ago 
where we had six or seven people from a couple different schools um, just talking about current circumstances, what are you doing, et cetera. And then um, we're in our third week of it now. We had it on Tuesday. It's grown to now 45 people have signed wow. up for it. <laughs> So we've got a lot of input, and it's great to hear from so many different sources, like what people are doing. So that's really helpful for staying sharp and um, figuring out what to do next and everything else right now, because it, it is weird. Yeah, it does seem like I've noticed a lot of this is that people are collaborating a lot. And I love that there's mm-hmm. like less competitive like it's almost like in times like these people get more banded together rather than competing. And I love that. It's like, there's like people are breaking down walls and saying, let me help and let's work together and let's come up with ideas. And just your example of there being a zoom call with other people in your position across college athletics, I think is, is motivating in a lot of different ways. Yes. We're sharing so many different ideas, emailing back and forth saying, Hey, I love this that you had. Can you share this info? And I'm doing stuff like that, getting my info to other people. And it's great because you know, the more we, the better we can all grow and we the industry. So, so I, I think it's safe to say that you are a naturally extroverted person. I think that's pretty clear to everybody listening, including myself. Um, do you think that, and I am too, so that's totally normal. Uh, do you think that's an important part of working in marketing and promotions is to have that kind of extroverted personality? Yes. Very necessary. Just to like, even be comfortable in your job and what you're doing and what you're being asked to do. Um, I mean, a lot of times what I have to do is, or what I'm trying to teach my intern to do is like, you got to find contestants for our promotions that we're doing at halftime of the basketball game. And sometimes they're ridiculous things where I put people in inflatable fat suits for a, a gym that we have a sponsorship with. And it's not always super easy to convince somebody to do that. Um, and if you're not an extrovert, you can, you can fake it and you can get the people. But if you're a natural extrovert and can really just, you know, kind of smooth that person and um, make them feel good about it, you're going to be able to easily get that person to say yes to whatever you need them to. I mean, even the same thing with um, handing out flyers at the, at the end of a football game. Um, there was one time it was me and then I had another intern across from me. Both handing out flyers that people are, were exiting a football game. And I was able to hand mine out left and right, being like, here you go, just you don't give them an option. You just say thanks for coming, and instead of saying, would you like this? And then um, my little intern on the other side, but she's very introverted, but I'm trying to pull her out of her shell, you know? Um, and she, she struggled a little bit, and so I kind of had to help her there. But I do think being extroverted helps a lot. It's not completely necessary, but it, but it helps. Yeah, there are a lot of roles. And I don't mean to make anybody who's more introverted feel like they can't be in the sports industry. Obviously, there's there's hundreds of roles in the sports industry that are that are suited well. It's just marketing and promotions tends to have a little bit different personality to it. And you clearly have that. I, I wanna, oh, yeah. we're, the, we're the showy people who love to, you know, have a big party kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's natural to have your extroverts fall over here. Yeah, it's an event. I mean, you got to make the community excited and the people excited. And if you're you're not able to to mirror that feeling, then they're not going to feel it either. Right. Exactly right. So, OK, every time I interview someone in sports marketing, whether it's with the Boston Celtics or GSE Worldwide or Anheuser-Busch or you at Lenore Ryan, all of you have marketing in your title, but you have very different focuses. Marketing is a really broad term. So if you were advising someone in college who may be listening right now who wanted to work in marketing, do you think they should try to go the jack of all trades route and try to do a little bit of everything and kind of get their fingers in there? Or is it better to kind of nail one skill, you know, really be good at digital or really be good at graphics or really be good at uh, event management or whatever it may be? Like, is it, what do you think? Should they specialize or go broader? You know, I think it's important to be broad and have skills in all of those areas or at least be able to, to make it work, have some Photoshop skills, even if you don't claim to be a graphic designer, that's me over here. Um, but I, I don't suggest really being, you know, just that one person or that, that one skilled person um, because you need to be able to, to do both and that, that's going to help you get jobs better because... Um, you know, someone may be having a, have an open position as a assistant director of marketing somewhere, but they, they also have a specific role that needs to be filled. And if you are um, just a, a ticketing person or primarily a ticketing person when it comes to marketing and that sales right there, um, and they need somebody who's way better at graphic design, you're not going to be as likely to get there. But if you can be 
multifaceted and have skills that can be sharpened or, um, you know, strengthened and get better at graphic design and still have those other strengths in other areas, you're going to be way more likely to find a job somewhere. So I think it's important to, you know, have your dabble in all of it, get decent at all of it, but then also figure out what is your strength and then really dive into that too. But don't lose those other skills. Leah, this has been so great. I want to finish up with this. I know I stole some of your thunder on some of my earlier questions, but I want to finish up with this. Uh, and we already talked about your cat and your dog. So there's, we've covered a lot. Um, <laughs> you play a really big role in the Lenore Ryan student athlete community service, which ranks uh-huh. inside the top 20 of all NCAA division two programs in the nation in terms of service hours. That's something to be very proud of right there. Why is this part of the job so important to you? Um, well, so actually my MBA is in nonprofit management for the specialty. So I, I love this kind of stuff, the nonprofit work, the community service. How can we benefit others? And because it's not just about what our sports and our games and getting people to come to us. But we want to be um, leaders and role models in the community. So I, you know, when I am helping kids or helping our student athletes find their community service opportunities and they're signing up for reading at an elementary school on Dr. Seuss Day, um, I can't guarantee that they're always getting this, but I hope that they see they're not there just reading a book to a crazy classroom of second graders. They're, what they're showing is like, hey, this could be you one day. You could be a college athlete as well. And they're becoming a role model for those kids. Uh, same thing when um, some of the, I took some basketball players over to our local boys and girls club, and they just did pick up basketball with the kids on the blacktop outside. And to see them, like, not only just interact with the kids, but teach them and invite them to come to the game, like, hey, we would love to see you there. To see that, it, it, that influence on those kids over there is incredible. And to be able to show those our student athletes that it's so much more than just your sport. And even you just being a student here, like, Life is about so much more than that. We'll make a difference. And I hope they're seeing that instead of just, I need to get a community service hours and then check this off my list. Um, but I mean, that's what's special about it to me. All right. So I lied. I have one more question. Um, <laughs> you mentioned them being a role model, but I look at you as a role model as well to young women out there who want to work in the sports industry in particular. So if a college student or if a younger woman come, comes up and asks you and says, how can I be like you are? How can I get to that point? What kind of advice or guidance would you give them? Because that's the, those are those are really important moments, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I would tell them it's important to build your network, get to know people. Don't just stay within the people that you know, because you'll never learn anything else. You need to get out there and figure out what other people are doing. Ask if you can interact with them. If you can even hop on a phone call with them and ask them questions about something that they did that you really liked, you liked their promotion. How they, how did they do their teddy bear talk? Because that was incredible. I mean, I've even done that. Um, so build your network and get to know other people and branch out as much as you can. Um, and know that also it can be almost challenging or not challenging. Um, like you feel like pressured to come up with like big new ideas all the time. Um, remember that your bad idea is eventually lead to good ideas. That's something I say all the time. Um, cause I have a bunch of bad ideas that eventually lead to something really good, but there's been a lot of bad ideas before it. So don't be afraid of that. And don't be afraid to just like think outside the box and think big. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things is don't always think small, think big, think that you've got to, you know, keep growing, get better and don't stay stagnant. I love that. I think it's wonderful advice. I think Brewer and Joe were very well behaved during this interview. (laughs) I'm glad we got to know them a little bit. I feel like I've bonded with them. So uh, (laughs) Leah, thanks to you and the whole team for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. I love, love, love the fact that Leah called me out when I said Appalachian State wrong. I think I said Appalachian. Anyway, whatever I said, it was wrong. And I love that she called me out midstream. That confidence and charisma is totally stand out. Right away, I knew we'd have a good vibe. Maybe she and I should do a weekly show together. Hmm. Stay tuned. <laughs>